Well, good afternoon. You have done it. You have made it to the final uh, lesson uh, of what's in the Bible, where we've looked at every single book of the Bible and just given a real basic idea of it and, you know, what the context is there. Uh, just a real simplified version. Obviously, there's a lot more we could go in-depth, and there's a lot, of thing, a lot of things we didn't get to even talk about. Uh, at the end, I'll, I'll mention the sources cited. But last week, we went through half of the New Testament, and we did it in chronological order instead of from the beginning to the end. So... <clears throat> So at the end of last week, I'm sorry, two weeks ago, uh, we we had it where um, it, Paul was in prison, and so we were at the end of the book of Acts. And Acts doesn't go, go any further than the 60s AD, so that's just kind of where we left off with Paul and, and Peter and everything. Nothing else is really uh, built on. It doesn't say about the different disciples that go out to the different parts and get martyred. It doesn't talk about Paul and Peter's death. It doesn't talk about any of that. So we ended last week with looking at, I'm sorry, two weeks ago, I keep saying that, two weeks ago with Ephesians, um, and then uh, those were the prison epistles. There's, uh, you know, uh, Philemon and Colossians and Ephesians. And then this week is Philippians, is right where we're going to start. This is the same, he's in the same imprisonment, but it's later on in it. So uh, Philippi, it, w w the church of Philippi was founded from Paul during his second missionary journey. You can read about that in the book of Acts. Philippi itself was a Roman colony, and there were a lot of veterans there. Uh, however, the church itself was largely poor, um, and you kind of hear him talking about that. And there's an, an, an apparent uh, kind of camaraderie thing that's happening between Paul and the church because Paul was imprisoned by the Romans and the church is um, living in the presence of the Romans uh, and obviously um, they didn't have full liberties and rights like like we would today uh, so there's obviously a little bit of that um, where they can kind of um, you know camaraderie where they where they kind of uh, have a hitching point I guess you could say um, Philippi was on a major highway it, it was not huge um, but it was somewhat important uh, for, for different ideas and whatnot. So in, not, not big, but still you know, important. It wasn't like an insignificant place. Um, it, as far as the letter to, to, uh, of Philippians, this was from the end of, of uh, uh, Paul's imprisonment in Rome. Um, things had degenerated in his case, uh, and he, he was not hopeful for his release. The, the, different, uh, the different hearings and stuff had not, had not gone well, <laughs> evidently. Or maybe they had gone well and it was just taking so long, they, whatever. Um, however it was, he was not hopeful for release, regardless of whether that was based on fact or his own emotions or whatever. Um, however, the church he's writing to, it would be a lot easier for them if they were treated under the umbrella of Jewishness. Uh, because Rome had a special agreement with the Jews um, where they, you know, they could do their whole don't worship the emperor thing. Uh, and Rome would just kind of leave them alone and that way they kind of just got along and you know leave each other alone um, and so Rome would offer them that safety that that safety did not apply uh, to Christians it was to Jews um, it, during different times in history that became more relevant than at other times but um, the big question was are Christians Jews or are they something else entirely and this was this was the root of the argument that they were having so uh, emperor worship was extremely extremely common in the in the ancient world and with it being a Roman colony, it seems like that was probably more uh, more dominant than maybe in some other places. Um, there was a lot of threats going on for for the Philippians themselves. There was obviously the threat of the Romans. There was a threat from within from Judaizers, people who wanted them to become Jews to be saved. Um, threats of sickness, thre uh, threats of of rival teachers, threats of different conflict in the church. In fact, it's it's in Philippians that we have these two women directly addressed, and, and Paul tells them, "Hey, you know, you guys need to get along." Um, <clears throat> so uh, a big theme of Philippians is to rejoice in conflict and trials. Um, and uh, focusing on, on, on the good in the midst of the bad. Um, so, for instance, uh, he focuses a lot on their giving and on their generosity, uh, you know, and, and highlights good things in the midst of all the bad, which is obviously an, an application of where he says, you know, what, if, if things are good and honorable, things about those things. So uh, it's, it's interesting, at least in the book of Philippians, not all problems are the faults of others. Sometimes they're from ourself that we have the problem. And that's in the case of the Philippian church, that's the case for at least part of it. Uh, they're having some of their problems are just self-induced problems. 
Um, there is a section on Jesus. Uh, it seems to be a poem. Uh, maybe it's a hymn from the early church. We don't really know. Uh, but it, 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 it is about Jesus. It's towards the beginning of the, of the letter. Not right at the beginning, but towards the beginning. And uh, it talks about some things about Jesus that are oftentimes misunderstood as far as him uh, not holding on to his position. But this is, the reason why this is quoted is because Paul is, is, a, is applying the theology of Jesus directly to the Philippian church. Um, taught and teaching them about uh, humility and not holding on to position, but being okay with being mistreated. Um, so, so what? What does it matter about Philippians? Well, God can give joy past adversity. And that's, that's definitely a promise uh, for all of us. <clears throat> now, the next two, two uh, books we're going to look at together, um, they're not necessarily related other than the fact that they were written at the same time and, and cover a lot of the same material. Um, Paul's imprisonment has ended. He went on another missionary journey. And that's where this letter picks up. He, he, this is after his Roman imprisonment, after the end of uh, Acts. So we're probably somewhere around 63-ish, maybe. Um, it's written to pastors who are dealing with some heresy in their churches and just kind of giving them direction and guidance to move forward. Paul always tried to make himself unnecessary in, in every ministry context. And what I mean by that is he tried to establish local leaders. He tries to, tried to raise up others. He tried to hand it off as much as possible. And in the case of Paul and Titus, I'm sorry, Timothy and Titus, um, they were set, set over these churches to, to kind of keep an eye over them. Titus was in Crete, and Timothy was in, um, it, you know, I, I'm drawing a blank. I want to say it was Ephesus, but I'm not, I'm not sure right now. Uh, anyways, uh, they were put over these churches and, and, and instructed to, you know, stay there for a time and, and kind of that. Uh, the the church, the letters were written to the to the pastors themselves, but. Um, they, there's no reason to assume that they were not uh, kind of dispersed among the church and also given to others, um, maybe other pastors and circulated that way as well. Um, but the main context is, is giving the pastors encouragement and direction in dealing with the heresies. It's interesting to note, though, in these letters that how the church relates to each other doesn't need to be in competition with the culture. And what I mean by that is, um, you know, we don't have to, like, prove ourselves less sexist than the culture, prove ourselves more, and, and, and try and be like, okay, well, the culture is really heated up about this social issue, so we have to, like, one-up them. The, the church, how the church relates to each other doesn't need to be in competition with the culture, uh, but it should accurately reflect Christ. So, let me kind of say this, okay? Yes, the church should stand against um, sexism and racism and all these different things, yes. But just because something's a hot topic in the culture and just because the culture sees something in a certain light doesn't mean we have to be in, comp in competition with them and do things in a way where they will necessarily agree with us. But how we do things should reflect the love and forgiveness and acceptance of Christ. And so it's kind of a tightrope there, but I think uh, in First Timothy and Titus, we see Paul walking that tightrope uh, very well. Um, so it's okay if someone is younger or an experience in leadership. That's okay. Um, you get experience by doing, and you definitely see that with Timothy. So well, what does it matter that we have these two books? Well, <laughs> these books have proven extremely valuable for pastors over time. Um, unfortunately, sometimes I think um, in some of the harsher churches I, I, I've seen, they kind of misuse Titus and, and First Timothy as a means of beating pastors over the head, like, oh, you aren't good enough to be a pastor. You aren't, you know, you don't meet up to these requirements. But the requirements of a pastor in these books aren't the same in both. That tells us that there's no one single list. It's more of this is the character and, and, and type of person to have as a pastor. Not that the pastor should constantly be judging himself and beating himself up, or that the board members should be constantly beating the pastor up. However, um, there does need to be, on, on the flip side of that, there also needs to be a standard to, ho to hold up to. Just like there should be a standard with board members or, or staff members or any leadership or, or secretaries or anything, really. Um, so, so well, what does it matter that we have these books? Well, what's good for the pastor is good for the church. And I mean that in two ways. First off, um, uh, as, the, as the pastor grows, the church will grow. But also, just because the pastor should be doing it doesn't mean the people shouldn't, right? So, oh, the pastor should grow the church. Well, the people should grow the church. <laughs> we should all be inviting people. So what's good for the pastor is good for the church. The leadership sets the tone in a church, absolutely, and says this is what we do, this is not what we do. Uh, one bad leader can make everybody jumpy. Uh, and the church follows along. Really, that's, that's oftentimes how it works. Um, 
and gossipers can't be on the board or in leadership or the church will follow. This is something very important. It's important that the pastor does not get involved with that kind of stuff and, and, and set the tone. Still, there are lessons here in the book, in these two books for everyone. Uh, just because a pastor is supposed to be this doesn't mean we shouldn't be too. You shouldn't go to First Timothy and Titus and say, ah, oh, there's nothing here for me since I'm not a pastor. No, no, that's not how that applies at all. Uh, the next book is First Peter. Uh, a little bit of a break from Paul for a little bit. Uh, written by Peter, obviously, but it wasn't written by his hand. It was written through a scribe. This is important to note because he's, he's a fisherman, and First Peter has really good uh, Greek. So, you know, it, especially when you read Second Peter, it seems like, oh, this is, this is one of these is a fake. Well, no, First Peter just had somebody writing for him. Um, the trials mentioned in the book were not widespread throughout the empire at the time that the book was written. They were localized. Um, so we shouldn't put too late of a date on this. Um, it was written from what he calls Babylon, but Babylon at this at the point that it, the book was written was had been destroyed uh, for a long time. <laughs> so Babylon really it become became kind of a keyword for the new church uh, for a wicked place. So in this context, it'd be Rome. Uh, maybe a modern day uh, Babylon would be maybe New York or maybe uh, Paris or something. I don't know. Just throw with me on that, okay? <laughs> Um, it, First Peter was written to scattered believers in various places. There's no like one church is given to. Um, it's just places throughout the empire. It seems like mostly the area of Turkey, so Bithynia and Galatia and so on. Um, the churches that he's writing to are largely apparently Gentile Christians, which is interesting because Peter was to the Jews and Paul was to the Gentiles. Yeah, here you have a letter um, to the apparently the Gentiles. So Peter was, Peter's not a main character in Acts halfway through. Like at the first half, he became, he, he was a main character, but then like on the second half, he stopped being the main character and switches over to Paul, and Paul and Luke are actually traveling together. So um, we don't have precise things, but it could be said that Peter was in Rome as early as the 40s. Uh, so this book was probably written in 63. Now obviously, um, I just had to Real quick here, uh, the Catholic Church is going to um, say some things that might not be historical about Peter and Rome because obviously with the, you know, papacy and all that. So anyways, moving forward, we'll just kind of move on from there. I'm not trying to make anybody look bad. I'm just, you know, saying that sometimes um, the, there's tradition that doesn't really have historical basis. So uh, <clears throat> anyways, First Peter itself was probably written uh, about 63, sometime just before the persecution under Emperor Nero in 64, I believe. Um, when it talks about how we are refugees in or exiles, I guess, in First Peter, he actually might be talking about literal refugees, not just Christians being homeless as far as this is in our home, although that is absolutely true, but he actually might be talking about literal refugees under all the different uh, things that have happened in the empire, uh, from, you know, people being kicked out of Rome for a period and, and people moving hostile things and all these different things. Um, First Peter does offer some very good responses to suffering. Uh, a very important book for those who are suffering, especially for the faith. So what does it matter? Uh, we aren't, weren't made to be perfectly content here on earth. And I think that we forget that because we try to have a perfect home, perfect life, all these different things. It just is not possible. And we're setting ourselves up for failure and disappointment. Next up is the book of Hebrews, which we've been going through on Wednesday night. Um, it was written sometimes in the 60s, most likely. Uh, the author is unknown, but it was written as a sermon, uh, not as a typical letter, which is interesting. Uh, it was written to a uh, to a Christian church or churches in Rome, most likely, with a Jewish background. So maybe not necessarily all the Church of Rome, but certain churches in Rome that were largely Jewish. They had had stuff taken away, uh, but they were gearing, gearing up for persecution to death, which is definitely fits Rome very well. They had been kicked out of Rome for a time. They had some, had some stuff taken away, and uh, the Emperor Nero's uh, persecution would begin in uh, 64. Now, the main idea of the book is that Jesus is superior. So, you're in Rome. Okay, Emperor Nero is not doing a good job. He does not have a very high approval rating. And so, he uh, there's a fire that starts in Rome, and so he looks for a scapegoat. And so, he, he turns to the to the Christians and starts, you know, uh, killing them in like the gladiator pits and all this different stuff. Uh, hanging them up and burning them and whatnot. And the people were like, yeah, this is, this is too far. This is kind of kind of weird and it's just kind of it didn't work very well for Nero and he ended up killing himself but during that period uh, I want to say it was 64 to 60 maybe 8 uh, things were very very tense in Rome and uh, it would been it would have been hard uh, to not just go back to G being a Jew uh, it would have been hard to you know stay in to not get out of Dodge you know um, it, Hebrews warns against falling away it warns about um, 
you know, staying faithful to Jesus and how going away from Jesus would be, you know, a sin that you know what you're doing. It's, it's not something that you can just take lightly. Um, so it, it seems like in Hebrews, he's not necessarily talking about an unforgivable sin, but it is impossible for you to renew some, somebody who's done that back to the faith because you can't preach them to them Jesus because Jesus is the one that they've repented from. So obviously it brings up some very, very troubling uh, philosophical questions like, well, is there forgiveness for that? Since in the law, there was no forgiveness for a sin that they knew, a high-handed sin. Well, this is, these are interesting things to, to weigh and, and to be concerned about. And um, I don't think we should be paranoid that we've lost our salvation or that somehow we've committed some kind of unforgivable sin. We should be focused on focusing on Jesus. I think that's what it comes down to. So well, what does the book of Hebrews um, matter at all? Well, no other book really transitions between the law and the early church as this one does. Maybe the Gospel of Matthew, which we're about to look at, uh, could be comparable, but not so much. Um, Hebrews also applies better to those who have been saved for a long time as compared to those who are new uh, new to the faith. So that takes us to the Gospel of Matthew. Uh, Matthew was written with Mark as a source. It wasn't his only source, but he did definitely um, have Mark as kind of a, uh, a one of the sources he was following. It was written more for the Jews, whereas Mark was more for like more of a seems seems to be more for like Romans uh, Roman audience. Uh, Matthew is more for the Jews. Um, and Jesus is portrayed as a teacher, and he's constantly called rabbi. He has five sermon sections, and you see this kind of typical Jewish uh, setup where he's constantly referring to the law and the things of the, the, of the Jews and whatnot. Uh, Pharisees in the book are shown in, 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 in very negative lights. This is compared to the Gospel of John, where they're so, shown in very positive light. Um, opposition to Jesus is a big uh, emphasizing factor in the Gospel of Matthew. Uh, Jesus is shown, shown as Messiah, as son of David, all Jewish things. Uh, Jesus' authority is a big theme um, with people questioning it and him showing it. So uh, it, em it emphasizes scripture fulfillment in relation to the law and the scriptures um, more, than other, more than the other gospels. Uh, it's written to somewhere in the Eastern Empire where there were large Jewish communities or recently saved Jewish churches, I, you know, either or. Uh, so maybe Syria? Maybe that area. Um, now, nowadays we have something called Messianic Jews, and these are very similar to the Judaizers that that uh, Paul warned about, uh, where they tried to be, you know, mix the following the law with being with faith, and it just doesn't really work too well. Uh, so I've definitely warned against that. It was written sometime in the mid '60s, um, somewhere around there, maybe '65. Uh, I don't think a specific date should be put, pressed too hard. Um, as many as many of the cases here where I give dates, a lot of these dates are more flexible than I'm than I'm saying. Um, there's very few that um, really only have a limited window of when they could be. Um, it was written by Levi, also called Matthew. He's one of the twelve, um, but not one of the three closest. Uh, the three closest were Peter, John, and um, oh man, I cannot believe I, I'm not. I can't remember this right now. Anyways, <laughs> it doesn't really matter. Anyways, I'm just you know brain fog, I guess. Uh, so what, what does the Gospel of Matthew matter? I mean, we already have the Gospel of Mark. Well, in, in Matthew, Jesus is shown more as king, and we follow him. It's more of, more of that, so there's kind of a battle of the kingdoms in, in uh, Matthew. It takes us to the book, sorry, the book of 2 Timothy, which is written about 67. 67. This is shortly before Paul's death in 68. Um, obviously, you can tell it's right there in the um, persecution under Emperor Nero. Uh, so after having gone to Spain and the western part of the Mediterranean, Paul has now once again become imprisoned in Rome. This is his second imprisonment in Rome. Uh, Emperor Nero, not a fan favorite, decided to torture Christians as a distraction, and it did not work. Uh, he ended up uh, killing himself. Paul's uh, hearing hadn't gone well, and he was giving uh, last instructions to Timothy in preparation for his death and also for Timothy's continued success. Uh, this is probably the only letter Paul wrote that wasn't intended to be read to a whole church. Um, I'm not saying that it wasn't read to a whole church. It just, it was intended from Paul to Timothy. So what, what is saying to Timothy matter? Well, life doesn't end with age, nor does it end with disappointments. And it's important that we always pour into the next generation. From the moment that you're elected or appointed or, or whatever, um, you have to think about your successor and you have to pour into them. That takes us to Second Peter, which is then Peter's last testament. Uh, it's very obviously written by Peter's own hand because the Greek is just terrible. You can definitely tell it was written by a fisherman. Uh, 
Paul's writing is already mentioned as scripture in Second Peter, um, which is interesting because he so Peter uh, equates Paul's writing with the Old Testament, but then also he says that it's sometimes difficult, and I find that ironic because Second Peter is is somewhat difficult to understand. Um, it was written sometime in 68 um, as a last testament uh, to various areas, probably including those in Turkey, probably similar areas as First uh, Peter. Uh, is written from Rome after Nero's persecution had already begun, uh, and Second Peter 2 is largely the book of Jude, uh, with false teaching a major concern. Uh, there's some a, a, a few big things that Peter's dealing with. First off, denial of the return of Jesus. Second off, scripture being inspired by God. And third, uh, what Christian morality is. So these three things are going to be take a major seat, uh, a major uh, focus in, in Second Peter. And so when scripture says this is important in Peter's and Paul's writing, in the last days, it's talking about the times that we are in right now. Uh, these are the last days. So when it says in the last days this will happen, these are those times. It's happening now. Peter is saying these things are happening now, and it's the last days. So uh, what does St. Peter matter? Well, uh, St. Peter uh, teaches to keep a close watch and not to be, and not to be led astray. A uh, very important um, uh, book, uh, especially today. I mean, it really hasn't uh, aged out. But there are some things that are hard to understand. Uh, maybe a, a study of Second Peter is, is due in the future. Um, definitely this class has not been able to look in depth at specific things. So we've looked at Paul, we've looked at Peter, now they're both dead and the years have passed. We're going to focus on John uh, in the 90s. So this is like 30 years later, quite a historical gap. Uh, and we're going to look at these. So none of the Gospels uh, were written to objectively detail Jesus' life and ministry. None of them. They all had an agenda. Um, you know, Matthew wanted to show Jesus as, as the king, as, as the Jew. Uh, the, he lived as a Jew. He came as a Jew. He fulfilled the law so we don't have to. Um, Mark wanted to show more of Jesus as the Son of God. Uh, Luke wanted to show him more as a, a human, you know, with compassion. Uh, that he, you know, was there for the downcast and the outcast and all that stuff. Well, John, John had, has his own agenda, too. Um, because, it, because the Gospel of John was written much later than the other Gospels, uh, to a different audience in a different world, it reads much different. And some things that were important to the other Gospels are just completely not important here. Um, there's not as big of a break between the Jews and the Christians here because it, it already has happened. John uses his own voice a lot, paraphrasing and interpreting Jesus to get the idea of what he said instead of the literal word of what he said, which is what all the Gospels did, but it's so jarring in the Gospel of John because Matthew, Mark, and Luke were all written around the same period of time, and Matthew and Luke both used Mark as a source, but John didn't too much. Um, John also records a lot of the misunderstandings that were going, on, going along in the early church, um, for instance, when when Jesus is talking about the destruction of the temple, um, John clarifies that it was, he was talking about himself. Um, there's there was an idea that John was never going to die; that he was going to live forever. Well, the Gospel of John clarifies that and says, "No, I'm not going to live forever. It, this is just he was just saying if I wanted to keep John alive, I could." Um, and so some of these things have been figured out with time. Some of them had become bigger issues with time. Um, for instance, in the Gospel of Mark, it seems like Jesus is going to come like within the hours after the book's being written. But then you get to Matthew and Luke and John, and it seems like it's not as urgent, but it's still going to happen. Um, and that's definitely a, a, a big thing that you see happening. Uh, and so for, for Peter, when he's writing St. Peter, he says, hey, uh, no, Jesus is still coming back. Time doesn't work the same for God, let it is for people. This is the reason why. Everybody was expecting for it to happen at that time. And uh, they were they were wrong. It did not happen the way that they thought, just like it didn't happen the way that the Jews thought. Um, so this gospel was clearly written by someone who was there. He's, this person is not an outsider writing later. It's not like Luke where he's compiling sources. He was there. Um, there are a lot of key details, for instance. Now, why didn't the Jewish leaders just kill Jesus themselves? Why did they take him to the Romans to kill? Well, in the Gospel of John, John explains that. Uh, John very much so contextualized his gospel. Um, Kingdom of Heaven, for instance, is only mentioned three times, but eternal life is mentioned 17 times. And then you get to 1 John, and he talks, that like, remains a big theme there. Um, and finally, John didn't distort or invent. He was occupied with truth. So if he was occupied with truth, why in the world would he, would he lie? Um, he didn't distort what Jesus said. He didn't invent what Jesus said. He just contextualized it 
and and worded it in such a way where he got the idea across but still fit the audience. Um, Jesus in the Gospel of John is portrayed as the Word, which is a philo philosophical idea, but also a, a Jewish idea. So there, there's a lot of different things here that, that is conjuring in the imagination of the readers. Um, Jesus is portrayed as the Lamb of God. He's shown as divine, whereas Matthew and Luke are both going to talk about, and, and about different points in Jesus' childhood. John's going to skip all that, and he's just going to go to the very, you know, from eternity and talk about Jesus existing from eternity and then bring him into the into the context of uh, the gospel. Um, so it was written about 90-ish, about 90 AD, uh, under Emperor Domitian, uh, which uh, the church experienced a time of intense suffering. Uh, the letters of John bring balance to the gospel. So some things that are brought up in the gospel, the letters of John... Uh, uh, you know, emphasize. So, whereas the Gospel of John is going to talk more about, uh, it's going to be worded in a way that sounds like John is talking about becoming perfect and sinless on earth. In First John, he's going to give kind of a kind of a, a balance to that. So, uh, uh, keeping commands over sinlessness in in First John. Jesus' humanity over his divinity in First John. Uh, and here's the issue is that false teachers were running rampant and taking what was said out of context to say, hey, look, even John's agreeing with us. Uh, Jesus was not really a human. Um, you know, we can be perfect and sinless and, you know, all these different things that were just not right. And so First John, you should definitely read the Gospel of John and First John alongside of each other because they bring balance to one another. Um, John sometimes a little bit one-sided and, and over... over um, over extreme to one to one side, and John First John by itself is also a little bit one sided. So when you read them together, you see you get kind of a fuller understanding of what's being said. Not that they contradict each other; they definitely do not contradict contradict each other, but they do have things that they um, are uh, emphasizing uh, because of the false teachers. So it was written by John, who's one of the twelve, and not only one of the twelve, he's one of the closest to Jesus, one of the three. It was written from Ephesus and written really to the world. It wasn't like the Matthew written to the Jews, Mark written to the Romans, or Luke written to the Gentiles. I'm sorry, the Greeks. It, it's more written to, to the world. It's written to everybody. Um, but it wasn't finished by John. He died, and then his, you know, either friends or disciples or whatever uh, finished it up and included um, him, the note about him dying. So, well, what does the Gospel of John matter? John wrote so that people would believe in Jesus. Largely, his purpose was evangelistic. The point of the Gospel of John is evangelism, to see people saved. So, first John then kind of picks up in the throes, written shortly after, written by John, uh, to the church in Ephesus, and John was apparently a, a bishop of some sort, a leader of some sort in, in the church at Ephesus. So it was written about 92. Um, as I said, he was a leader, and many thought he would never die, uh, more than likely because he lived to be very old. Uh, there were a lot of false teachings going on that First John talks about, uh, for instance, denying Christ as human, uh, claiming perfection, and living immorally. Um, so some of the ideas, to give them titles, Gnosticism, uh, docetism or docetism, however you say that, and Corinthianism, not Corinthianism, Corinthianism uh, with an E. Um, and so the idea there being living, uh, living lawless, but claiming spiritual maturity. Um, Christ only seemed to be human, but he wasn't really. Uh, the Spirit descended on Christ at baptism and then left him before the crucifixion because God couldn't have possibly gone through that. Uh, John offers a series of tests of life in the book of in the letter of 1 John. Um, and these are things for believers to kind of weigh themselves against. So there's the first one is love, uh, not just for God, but for, for each other. Uh, the second one is obeying the commands. Um, you know, not living however you want. And then the third thing is believing Jesus as God and human. Um, so John emphasized love so much that people asked why he repeated himself. And this is what he said. He said, well, it was Jesus' command, and if it is done, it is enough. And that was quoted by Jerome, um, although I kind of uh, didn't say read the exact quote. Uh, so well, what does First John matter? Well, <laughs> it, it, it gives assurance to God's people. And I think that's uh, something that oftentimes there's so many different people who feel like they, um, they messed up too much. Maybe they, maybe they lost their salvation. Maybe they aren't. Um, Maybe they never were saved. And, and I think First John gives a good uh, source of encouragement, especially when you read through books like Hebrews, where he's talking about, you know, something that sounds like an unforgivable sin. You start second-guessing and thinking, maybe I'm not really saved. Maybe I lost my salvation. So Second John picks up right after. Uh, the false teachers are, are attacking the church, but this time from the outside, since they have left or have been kicked out. I'm not sure. But in First John, they were in the church. In Second John, they're outside, but they're still attacking the church. Um, and don't think attacking like with a sword. Think attacking like it's 
arguing, spreading rumors, that kind of stuff. Um, John is writing to a specific house church in Ephesus, though. Um, he mentions as children of the chosen sister, uh, the, uh, talking about a, a sister church, not an actual sister. Um, it is, it, he, John uses a lot of metaphors and that kind of stuff. Um, it's written about 92 or so. Uh, so what, what does St. John matter? Well, we can't believe everything. We cannot believe everything, but must weigh what teachers teach. This is extremely important in light, especially in light of a lot of the televangelists that we have access to in our day. Third John was written to a specific person in a specific church in the church of Ephesus. Uh, his name was Gaius. Uh, at the time, inns were inhospitable and uh, money was often lacking for Christians. So Christians were, it was a, in, even more important at that time for Christians uh, to care for one another. You know, just like nowadays when there's places uh, in the world um, that, that things are a lot worse off than in the Western world, uh, Christians really have to step up and fill in that gap. Um, I think that the prosperity of the Western church has kind of brought a little bit of a nulling uh, to, to this teaching. Um, and there's a lot more people nowadays that take advantage of it. Um, and then they say stuff like, oh, well, that's not scriptural. That's not, you're not acting like a Bible. You're not, you're not following the Bible. But even Paul, even Paul, that doesn't sound Christian, but even Paul talks about the way um, that widows shouldn't be put on a support list until they meet a certain criteria. So even Paul understood that, that you couldn't go to the extreme that some of the modern uh, Western um, uh, church hoppers do, where churches have to fund them instead of them growing up and acting mature. Uh, there was a different context back then. It wasn't an issue of the people being mature. It's just that they were poor and the empire was taxing them. Uh, over tax them, I should say. So at least one of the false teachers now has the upper hand in, in at least one of the churches of Ephesus. Um, and these epistles definitely show the slow decline of a church. Very sad to see, but no matter what John did, it didn't seem like it was enough. And, and obviously these things still happen today. Nowadays, there's still power struggles and whatnot. Uh, pastors have to protect the church as best as they can, though, which is frustrating because many people like to pretend it doesn't exist. And uh, for many others, they'll call the pastor paranoid and then they'll say things like, well, you can't, you, you can't act like that. That's not acting like a Christian. No, you can't call them out by name. And you definitely shouldn't call people out in a congregation from the stage. But you definitely should talk to them and, and warn them and, and those kinds of things. Um, like, here, this, is what, this is the emphasis I'm trying to, the, 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 the line I'm trying to draw, right? So if somebody's filled with the Spirit, they don't get up on the stage and give a word directly attacking somebody, right? If you have a problem with somebody, you go and talk to them one-on-one, -on -one, and nine out of ten times it's going to be your own problem, not something wrong that they were doing. The one-tenth of the time that it is something that, that they're doing, it needs to be addressed between two friends, not between somebody with a bad attitude uh, nitpicking somebody else. You know, there should be humility and that kind of stuff. But that's not really what we're talking about. We're talking about somebody who's causing dissension, in which case, in which case the pastor should address and oppose that. Um, and yes, sometimes uh, calling them by name is, is something that even Paul showed was an acceptable uh, practice. Not that you should call everybody from out from the stage, nor should it be the first line. It should be the uh, very last line. For instance, let's say somebody gets up out of their chair and starts giving a word that's not from God and is claiming that it is. Yes, the pastor at that point should stand up and put an end to it at that point from the stage. Yes. Absolutely. Um, if somebody has caused a problem in a church and they still have followers in the church that are causing problems, oftentimes, not every time, but oftentimes it should be addressed um, by name without cloak and dagger kind of stuff. However, once again, that does not mean that people should be should have their letters read or be called out from the stage like the church used to do uh, 50 years ago. That was just a bad idea. Um, and so uh, I guess what I'm trying to say here is that uh, pastors should protect the church, but protecting doesn't mean embarrassing people from the stage. And I think that's that's kind of what I'm getting at. And so the pastor shouldn't do that. Definitely the church shouldn't do that either. Um, definitely not. Uh, you don't get up on the mic and say things that are going to just try and, and, and draw heat on somebody like that. I mean, if you have something to say, go to the person and say it. Um, but on that, with that being said, a lot of times... Uh, I've dealt with a lot of board members and, 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 and people in the church and pastors too who want to just pretend like the problem doesn't exist and then they get called names like paranoid if you try to deal with it you're called paranoid and all this different stuff and it's like no 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 I mean there's this one time that I had somebody on my worship team and they were causing a problem and one of the people on the worship team was very much so still uh, causing problems and affected by that bad attitude and so I tried to bring it up one time and they said oh you're just paranoid you need to stop talking about her all this different stuff and it turns out that they left with the same bad attitude under very similar circumstances because they were never able to break away from that bad attitude um, that uh, that that the person living in sin kind of handed off to them so 
you don't get to publicly oppose if you didn't privately confront, and I think that's an important thing. But this isn't a conversation about uh, you know people being rebuked. This is I'm, I'm just trying to trying to talk about Third John, where he is talking about guys, and he directly addresses somebody else and says this person is being is is loves to be first, and he directly calls them out by their name. Um, and the reason being is because they were causing a problem. They were trying to take over the church. They were teaching heresy, and uh, and John uh, was trying to deal with it, but it it was not going well. So it was a very uh, tense situation. It wasn't your typical titu- situation. Third John was written some, probably sometime sometime around ninety two or ninety three, and it was written to encourage Christian living, like you know caring for others. So what was the matter? Well, Christians must care for one another, especially though not. Um, though not writing off the world, they should definitely, especially care for one another. Um, yes, we should love and serve uh, the world, but that doesn't mean we should write each other off. And a lot of times pastors will, won't will highlight that, and they'll go to the extremes. Either a church will become very self-centered, only caring about itself, or it'll go to the other extreme and um, and, and never, uh, uh, what am I saying here? That, that, that they'll either only care for themselves or they'll only care for the world, and there just won't be that family sense. So um, the church definitely should be a family. Um, and you don't have to go to either extremes. Yes, we should love and care for each other, and we should also love and serve the world. Um, and a lot of times, pastors kind of go to one extreme or the other. And that takes us to the last book of the New Testament, written the last, uh, called Revelation. Uh, a, a couple points to make. It's not Revelations. It's Revelation. It is one single book united in its themes. It's the Revelation. And second off, it's not John's revelation. It's the revelation of Jesus Christ. So not revelations and not John's revelation, but Jesus' revelation. So uh, that's important to note. Um, and I'll let the theolo- theologians argue themselves with what all that entails. I just want to point that out. So it was written from exile. Uh, John is on an island called Patmos uh, where he has been exiled. Written sometime around 95 um, and it was largely written to churches in Western Turkey, as the beginning of the book kind of shows us uh, these these seven churches. Uh, not that it only went to those churches, but it definitely uh, included those churches. It was written in a different style from the rest of the New Testament called apocalyptic. Um, so in apocalyptic writing, there's more mysticism. It's not it, Things aren't overly literal. So there's a lot of like imagery and that kind of stuff. But it w- whatever those things mean, it has to be coherent with the time. It can't fit modern imagery. It had to have been something that the original audience would have understood. Uh, for instance, in the old in the Old Testament prophecies, we're talking about the eagles. Eagles are not symbolic of America. Okay, you have to remember it was written to them then there. You have to understand it then and there before you apply it to here and now. Um, it goes from the present at the beginning of the book to the near future later on in the book and then to the distant future at the end of the book and there will be tribulations before the end there will be times of severe um, suffering as we have seen um, and we will not be ex- be saved from experiencing discomfort we're going to have things happen in various parts of the world that are not uh, good and i think that we've really had a good and, and been babied here in america and we've kind of lost our edge but that doesn't mean that it always will be like that in america uh, th- the Christian culture though really works against us when we're reading books like Revelation, uh, because we have uh, we have a history to us, right? So there's like the left behind books that have been made into movies, and we get it in our head. This is how it is. Like it's similar to how Pinocchio skewed our opinion of Jonah, where we see Jonah in this large well, just kind of sitting there chilling out, resting on a boat. It probably was not that comfortable. Uh, it was probably something a lot more uh, un. Uh, unpleasing uh, than that. And some, so, so our culture very much so uh, affects us, but Christian culture really has a way of blinding us to things. Um, theories and, and end time teachers that have been going around on, 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 on the television and stuff like John Hagee and stuff. And, uh, you know, we, these are all affecting the way that we see the end times in the book of Revelation. And it's worth mentioning that to date, 100% of them, them have been wrong about the end times. So keep that in mind when you're, when you're, um, when you, if you've got somebody that you really like uh, that's an end time teacher, um, so uh, we'll know in the end when it happens uh, what happened. <laughs> uh, the idea of revelation isn't to make us question everything; it's to make us look for Jesus in everything and to trust in Jesus in the midst of it. And you know, not to always find conspiracy theories or end times things, but to excuse me, but to rather keep Christ as the center of our of our life and of our world. So there is nothing we are waiting on for the rapture. The rapture could happen at any time. Um, it says that the end won't come until the man of lawlessness is revealed. Um, 
it definitely says that, but we are not waiting for a temple to be rebuilt or anything like that. The rapture can happen at any time. Um, and, uh, yeah, so uh, if we are looking for any signs, the sign that we are looking for uh, will be the man of lawlessness revealed, uh, but we don't know how soon that will be before the end. For instance, it could happen mere seconds before the end. Um, <clears throat> it's interesting, though, because, and, and this is not a political statement um, against or for President Trump, okay? So get that out of your head. I just want to make an observation. Uh, when President Trump was president, okay, Donald Trump, he made an agreement with the Middle East. It was a huge deal, and everybody was really excited about it for good reason. But the important thing to, that I want to highlight is that is exactly what the Antichrist is going to be able to do. He's going to bring peace. Uh, everybody's going to be, oh, wow, that's so great. They're going to be completely captivated. And I'm not saying that Donald Trump is the Antichrist. I'm not saying that at all. I'm just saying it's going to be similar to that, where he's going to do something that seems impossible, and everybody's like, wow, he's our savior. He's going to fix everything. It's not as bad as we all thought it was. Um, so he's going to bring peace where there wasn't peace, and he's going to fool many people, even doing signs and wonders, uh, miracles, things that really blow people away. So tread very lightly in the book of Revelation and beware of teachers who have a, uh, a system to completely understand. I, I, I've made this sheet, and I have complete understanding of the, uh, of the, of the end times. No, 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 no. Just be careful with that, okay? So uh, what does the book of Revelation matter? Shouldn't we just ignore it in light of all the bad uh, interpretations we have? No, 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 not at all. Revelation shows us that God is in control of chaotic history, and we win in the end. And uh, it definitely gives us a, a good, a good, um, a good hope for the future. So some of the sources that I cited um, for this class, uh, I can't remember all of them because I've been so strongly impacted by so many different wonderful people and things online and books and scholarly articles and all these different things. So to be able to to say this for sure, I, I unfortunately can't can't remember every single source. It's just had a, a very important impact on my development. But I can for sure list some of the biggest ones. Uh, Craig Blomberg has been a huge uh, impact on this class. Uh, two of his books specifically I think I can point you towards. The first is called From Pentecost to Patmos. The second one is called Jesus and the Gospels. Both worth checking out. Uh, another one is a little tiny book, um, probably cost you a buck, uh, called Know Your Bible. Um, a lot of the outlining that I did for this uh, was, was based off of that. And then the last two that I want to mention is a book called Encountering the Old Testament and Encountering the New Testament. They're companion books. They're surveys of the Old Testament and New Testament, respectively. So thank you for watching uh, this, and I hope that you learned something. If there are questions, don't forget, uh, you can always put them in the question box at the back in the back of the auditorium. Uh, thank you so much for watching, and have a great rest of your week.